is the day the Lord has made. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Charles Truax, as you may have noted in your bulletin there. I'm filling in for Pastor Judd, who's on vacation. It's great to be back with you again. And I want to confess to you, however, that the last time I conducted a matin service was 30 years ago <laughs> in a different hymnal. And since I don't read music, I'm going to say my parts, but I would love for you to sing your parts. So please forgive an old man who hasn't done this in a very, very long time. I invite you now to stand if you are able as we sing, Lord, take my hand and lead me.
Almighty, merciful Lord, grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. I invite you to stand. O Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me.
For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. at 
at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand for the gospel if you are able. The Holy Gospel from St. Mark, the fifth chapter. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. It's time for the children's message. to 
to listen. It doesn't mean he will always fix every simple problem that comes our way, but we can trust that he has the best for us and that one day there will be healing for everyone. Maybe not on earth, but eventually at the resurrection. He always heals our hearts and takes our sins away. The healing I'm going to focus on today is that after Jesus healed a woman who was sick for 12 years, Jesus got word that the little girl that he was on his way to heal had died. And I'm going to have Pearson help me act that out. Can you put your hand out like a puppet? And notice what he's doing so that when you get your own, you'll know what to do, okay? All right, now, he's a, uh, this is Jairus' daughter, Jesus' friend, Jairus' daughter, and she's sleeping now. He's, she's in bed, oh no, and she's getting really sick. And he, Jesus got word that the girl had died, and everyone was very sad. And Jesus said, she's not dead, she's just asleep. But everyone laughed at him. He went on his way to the father and mother, the house of the little girl who was in her bed. Everyone was very sad and crying because they believed she was really dead. Jesus went to her. He reached out his hand. He touched the little girl. He said, child, rise. She sat up, looked around. Show everybody. Isn't that cool? <laughs> she began walking and said, I'm hungry. Can I have something to eat? Her parents were amazed. They knew she was dead. She didn't have a heartbeat. She wasn't breathing. She had been so sick. She had died. But Jesus healed her, and she was alive. What a wonderful God we have. So today we have learned that Jesus' power gives us life. And that reminds me of one of my favorite songs. Do you know this song? My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. And then you clap. Will you sing with me? My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Clap, clap. One more time, nice and loud. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Nice. Let's pray. Repeat after me, please. Dear God, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for amazing miracles. Thank you for giving me all that I need. I know that you keep your promises. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, try, you know, in the sermon, try not to crinkle too loud during the sermon. Early service was a little loud, so um, here we go. You get crayons and a puppet.
peace be to you from Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The text for the message this morning comes from our gospel lesson. And while he was still speaking, Jesus, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And when he entered the house, he said to the mourners, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. My dear Christian friends, every single day we are being influenced and influencing others. Dr. Milton Wright, the Bishop of the Brethren Church of Indiana and Ohio, was holding his swan song, the last church convention of his career, and he wanted everything to be perfect. It was 1870. The Civil War had ended, and there was general peace in the world, and he invited his old friend, the president of the University of Indiana, to be the keynote speaker and speak about the future. And when it came time for the president to stand up, he reminded them about the transcontinental railroad that was being planned and being built to join this nation into one union, and a great, the great steamships that were being developed that then would unite the world together. And then he said, and I even envision in the future that one day man will fly like the bird. And the whole house erupted in commotion and charges and finger pointing and calls to have the man removed for blasphemy and heresy. And it got to a point where the bishop could not restore order in his beloved convention and everyone started steaming, streaming out of the room, still yelling accusations and accusing people of all kinds of things because everyone knew that only birds and angels could fly. Well, when the bishop got home, he complained to his oldest son and his wife about how his beloved convention had fallen apart, all because his old friend had told people this abomination that men someday would fly like birds. Well, the oldest son dismissed his father because he knew his father was this traditional man who was set in his rigid ways. But there was something curious about what the president of the university had said about man flying like birds. Well, after the youngest son was born, the bishop died. And about 30 years later, the oldest son and the youngest son went into business together and they set up a bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio. And of course, you know the rest of the story, that on December 17, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright launched out the first manned-powered flight in our history and changed the world, all because of what a man said to their father that they never met, but inspired them to understand that there were great things possible out there, and they made them happen. St. Paul understands the importance of being influenced by other people. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he writes about his young student, Timothy, and reminds Timothy, I knew your grandmother, Lois, and her faith, and how she instilled that faith in your mother, Eunice, and how those two instilled their faith in you and make you the young man and the young pastor that I see in you and have called you in to work for the Lord. Incredible how God works, using the likes of us to influence one another to change his world and touch the lives of other people. I stand before you this morning because of Roger and Dottie Jones, who lived around the corner from me and took me to the Lutheran Church and there introduced me to Phil and Shirley Croft, the youth counselors. And those couples took me under their wing and shepherded me through my growing faith, along with Pastor Walter Rooning. 
And when I shared with them that I felt that God wanted me to become a pastor, they worked extremely hard to help me make that dream come true. And I am terribly indebted to them for their gift to me. How about you? Who made it possible for you to be here this morning? Who encouraged your faith? Who took you under their wing? Who raised you in the Christian faith and inculcated in you this message of the good news of Jesus Christ? Isn't it incredible how God works in interesting ways through the lives of other people? And this morning I simply wanted to have a moment to have you join me in mentally thanking those people for making us who we are. For it's a powerful thing that God has chosen to do through the likes of those kind of people in our lives. And now it's our turn. God has called us to influence other people, the next generation. For there are people out in our world, out there in our workplaces and at school and in our neighborhoods and even in our own homes who are silently crying out for help, who are looking for answers to the problems of life, who are looking for some hope in this hopeless world. And we have those answers in Jesus Christ. And he has called on us to influence those people, small ways and large, by our words and by our actions and by our attitudes. For that's the plan that God has established to carry out his way in our world. And unfortunately, God is dealing with human beings. And there's a dark side to all of this as well. For many times, instead of doing what God wants us to do, we end up getting in his way, saying the wrong thing, doing incredibly bad things, refusing to get involved in another person's life when we know that it could make a difference, and on and on. I'm reminded of a story about how bad influence turns out about a TV repairman who watched helplessly as a huge windstorm devastated his neighborhood, including his own house, and took his outdoor TV antenna and twisted it around and pointed it downward and broke off part of it. Well, he was so busy helping other people that he didn't have a chance to get around and fix his own. A new family moved in next door discovered that their TV antenna had been ripped off their roof. So dad went and bought a brand new one, put it up there and attached it to the chimney like you're supposed to in those days, and then decided he knew exactly how to point it because his next door neighbor was the TV repairman. <laughs> and twisted it and pointed it down and then, yeah, you got it, reached up there and snapped off part of it. How easy it is to badly influence other people. You know, in my home congregation, not only were there those wonderful voices I've mentioned to you, but there was our head elder. And he made it very clear to each and every member of the congregation that he hated kids. That kids were a useless attachment to a church. They shouldn't be listened to, they shouldn't be cared for. And we certainly shouldn't spend any money or resources on them. He would preach regularly. And quite frankly, there was only one thing that he hated worse than kids. And that was pastors who wanted to pay attention to taking care of kids and youth. And so you can imagine poor Pastor Running putting up with his elder, head elder for seven years. Well, when the head elder found out that I felt that God was calling me to become a pastor... He found me at church and he gave me a talking to and told me in no uncertain terms that I was making a big mistake, that God indeed wouldn't waste me on something like the pastoral ministry, that we, I needed to find something more honest and noble to do than that kind of business, he told me. And well, I couldn't resist. And so I asked him, well, what else? would you have me do? And he, without missing a beat, said, doesn't make any difference as long as it isn't a pastor because that's a waste of time. Well, obviously, there were other voices in the congregation that spoke more loudly than he was speaking because if he had had his way, I would not be standing up here in front of you this morning. 
How sad when that becomes our attitude towards the people we're supposed to help and encourage and influence positively. But here we are, talking behind people's backs, gossiping about them, saying unkind things even to their faces when we know better. You know, in my ministry, I have heard parents in public say to their children, you will amount to nothing. You aren't worth it. You are going to fail in life. How sad when we do that to people because we write them off and say they just aren't that important and God couldn't possibly work through you to make a difference in our world. And how much we miss when we discourage people and don't do the right thing with them. The young man sat in the congregation of his church for a long time looking at the wonderful stained glass windows in his church of St. Matthew and St. Mark and St. Luke and St. John and St. Peter and St. Paul and St. Timothy. So during one of the Sunday school lessons when the teacher asked what's a saint, he raised his hand quickly and said, I know, a saint is someone through whom the light shines. Someone through whom the light shines. Saints are regular, ordinary people, just like you and me. In fact, we're saints. Anytime that we allow God's light to shine through us to someone else, anytime we allow his spirit to work through us to touch a life positively for him, then we are working as saints for the Lord. And that feels pretty good when you see what a difference you can make in someone else's life. And along the way, you never know who you might be touching. Maybe you're influencing a future leader in the church, a future pastor, a future teacher, or incredibly, you might even be the one out there influencing a dreamer of dreams or a builder of aircraft. In his name then, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand and sing the Te Deum.
heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, from whom our help comes, you have brought us into your holy Christian church and made Christ our shield from our every enemy. Preserve us in such faith until at last you bring us out of this world in the resurrection forevermore. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Father, you have shown to your church the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sakes became poor, that by his poverty we might become rich. Give us generous hearts, that our abundance may supply our fellow saints in their need. Let our preachers serve for the sake of Christ's call, not for earthly gain. And let those who have received excellence in faith, speech, and knowledge, and every other gift of God's word, provide richly for the preaching of the gospel and the work of the church. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord. Your compassion does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men, but your mercies are new every morning. Bestow your steadfast love on every Christian home. Turn parents in kindness to their children. Make children ready in obedience and love toward their parents and each other. Let the young learn discipline and trust in you, and let fathers not exasperate their children but be devoted to the fear and instruction of the Lord as examples to them. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, you did not turn aside the bold request of Jairus, nor the timid faith of the woman. We implore you, hear our prayers for those in need. Drive away our fears and give us believing faith. Give healing and strength to the sick and suffering. And especially this day do we remember Dan, Debbie, and Mancasey, and JT and Lauren, Bob, Jimmy, Jim, Amy, Randy, Freddie, Carter, and Emma, Jenny and Barbara, Dan and Jeff, Beth and Dana and Will and Carla, Terry and Brian and Roxanne and Bob, Rebecca and Beverly and Bethany and Elias, Carolyn and Debbie and Brian and Sherry, Grace and Danielle and Kelly, and Rob and Amanda and Ella and Greg. Give th comfort to those who mourn, especially the family of Evelyn, Evelyn Langman. And bless them with the knowledge that Christ has destroyed death and all who die in him are only sleeping until you awaken them at the last day. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, a mighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.